So today, Julien and me are going to talk about observing the HashiCorp ecosystem from Prometheus. But let's talk about who we are first. Um, hi, my name is Chris. I used to be a developer, and then I became an ops person. Um, for the past two decades, I spent my life helping people to deploy software. Yes, that's painful. Um, I do that in multiple roles. Um, I basically started Inuits about 15 years ago. Inuits is an open source consultancy. And about four months ago, together with Chilien, we started a spin-off, which is called Oli, which is focusing on Prometheus. Next to helping customers, I also tend to start a couple of conferences. Uh, apologies to everybody who has to call himself a DevOps engineer. It just shows that your employer doesn't understand what DevOps means. That was not the idea when Patrick and I started the conference. And next to DevOps days, I also started Config Management Camp, Load Days, and all the other things. And most of you, when they run into a DNS problem, they curse at me on Twitter. So please keep doing that, so I know that still everything is a freaking DNS problem. And uh, my name is Julien Pivoto, and uh, I am maintainer of Prometheus. Uh, I am uh, active in the open source monitoring uh, ecosystem for a long time now, so I've been in the open source ecosystem for like 10 years. And uh, I am now working also at Oli, where we uh, ma mainly do uh, support and services around open source observability. I also believe uh, in the DevOps uh, ecosystem and environment. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter and Twitter pass uh, Juan Lapli. So, Oli, Inuits, it's confusing, I guess. With Inuits, we built over 15 years of open source experience, helping customers to deploy platforms. Uh, we've got multiple Nomad deployments, which we're actively building and operating. So we, we learn from our mistakes. And part of the things we were seeing is that there's a lot of demand to do open source monitoring and metrics the right way. Julien being a maintainer of Prometheus, we basically figured out we're going to do a spin-off, we're going to start a new entity and really focus on professional services and support around Prometheus. And next month, as you might have seen on the Prometheus list, we're actually going to release the long-term support version of Prometheus. Um, and eventually, a distribution. So, monitoring. Who likes monitoring? Has that always been that way? So I said 15 years ago, which kind of means I'm old, or as I like to say, experienced. I, together with Tom the Coleman, did a research paper for Ottawa Linux Symposium back when you still had to write papers to present at a conference. And we were comparing all the open source tools that were available back then in the ecosystem. Who still remembers Nagios? What we figured out back then was that there were a set of really bloated Java tools that basically you needed more compute power to run than the actual platform you were monitoring. So those didn't work. You had a bunch of open core platforms that really forced you into, once you wanted to really do monitoring, do something you didn't like, go to a proprietary solution. And then we also found a bunch of tools like Xenos back in the days. Once you had more than 20 nodes, you actually needed the DBA to do performance tuning of the application. So your monitoring was already your pain point. And really, back then, Agile was the king in the open source world. So fast forward a couple of years, 2011, we had started DevOps days. And John Vincent loses on Twitter, tweeted out like monitoring sucks. And it became a sub-movement of the whole DevOps movement. And we had a GitHub repository where we were evaluating what tools were around. There was a lot of new things popping up. But the frustration really was that most of what people were doing was manual configuration, which was absolutely not in sync with reality. We were doing some monitoring on hosts, services, maybe sometimes. But application monitoring, like 10 years ago, the exceptions were doing that. But it was a fast changing point, because even six months later, at DevOps Days Rome in 2011, Ulf Manson, 
gave an ignite about his newfound love for monitoring. He had his kids draw his slides with these hearts, and he was talking about why he started liking monitoring again. And the reason why was not only the new era of tools, in this case it was Sensu, but it was mostly because he managed to automate everything. He managed to go to a point where there were no manual changes in his ecosystem. When he spun up new resources, they were monitored. And that newfound love, not that much later, we see in the ecosystem a new tool popped up, Prometheus. So, going from monitoring socks to monitoring love, new tools started popping up. It's improvement. It's how our community works. It's how we, as a group, improve software. Whoops, that's two clicks. But what really is monitoring? Well, the idea that you have a high-level overview of the state of every component in your infrastructure, whether it's an application or an underlying functionality, and then you look at if it is still available. Like, if your customer calls you that your application is down, it's too late. And you focus mostly on the technical components. And sometimes you're like, the customer calls because it's slow. Maybe it's so slow for them, not for you, but you can kind of get a view on what's going on. And in that traditional view of monitoring, even though we've been preaching automation for ages, we still see that a lot of people are doing their monitoring manually. The monitoring platform is totally drifted from reality. They have things partially automated, and they have a lot of work to actually keep things in sync. Like, when they decommission an instance, the monitoring isn't reconfigured automatically. And it's also not really a good view. It's on or off. It's not like it works for 75% of the cases. It works. So all of those typical problems with monitoring basically result in alert fatigue. Who has alert fatigue here? The rest are just too lazy to raise their hands because they've already been doing it all day. So those pitfalls are things we want to fix. We need to improve these things. So what is observability? Well, observability is the idea that we look at it differently. We're going to look at how these services actually behave. We're going to look at it as if we were in the place of the applications and not the outside, without actually instrumenting it. Trying to figure out why is this happening rather than, oops, it happened. And they're both required. Monitoring is required, but if you're lucky, it's enough. And Julien is the one who claimed that, well, observability is removing that luck. So that's how monitoring and observability fit together. In practice, there's three pillars in the observability ecosystem. There's metrics, like nice random graphs, like this one, where you use things like Grafana or uh, Persis. There's logs, where you have clear views on what the applications have been telling you. And There's traces, and I really want log files on what this device actually reads. And there's traces. And with those three components, you can do a lot, including using Prometheus. So let's go uh, with the Prometheus itself. So um, Prometheus is really for the metrics part. So Prometheus uh, is an open source project, uh, which is part of the CNCF. The CNCF is a Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and it is the, the foundation that also hosts projects like um, Kubernetes, Jaeger. So there is not a single company behind Prometheus, but it's rather it's a collaboration between uh, multiple companies. So Prometheus, really what it's doing is that it will collect and store your metrics uh, in order for you to understand your infrastructure, understand your applications. It is pool-based, which means that Prometheus itself is at the center of your infrastructure, and it will go and query every application to get the metrics that they have to offer. 
unlike other uh, monitoring system, Prometheus will pull quite frequently, like uh, every, for example, 15 or 30 seconds, you will get the latest metrics, and then you can run your alerting based on top of that. Um, there is service recovery, so which is really important to make sure that uh, what Prometheus is monitoring is the current state of your infrastructure, which means that if you are removing a service, if you are adding a service, a node, Prometheus will notice it directly and will start the monitoring of that node, of that new service. We are fully compatible with console, and that for a very, very long time, so there is a very long relationship between Prometheus and console. Um, and it just worked really well. We are looking forward to maybe at uh, native nomad support in the future as well. Uh, we will see how that's going. Prometheus is also uh, an alerting solution, which means that not only you can uh, take your metrics, uh, collect them, store them, uh, but you can also alert based on Prometheus. So you can replace your existing monitoring solution with Prometheus uh, end to end. The Prometheus ecosystem is uh, really a big, big, big ecosystem. There are thousands of exporters, uh, open source, closed source. There are also many, many applications which directly output uh, Prometheus metrics, like most of the Ashikor products. Um, and uh, yeah, we are working on the long-term support release to help uh, enterprises uh, adopt Prometheus even more. So we already see that uh, many, many companies are using Prometheus nowadays, we want to help them further. So the Prometheus data model uh, is quite simple. So it's all based on metrics. And a metrics, basically, you have a name, and then you have a set of labels and a value. For example, you can collect the number of HTTP requests, and then uh, the label will be the error rate or the error code. But you can also have labels uh, for your data center name, your console cluster, name, um, and all, all that kind of things are also uh, labels that you can alert on, well, that you can see in your metrics. And then when you get your alerts, you get the full context of your alerts. You get the full context of your metrics. And then you can easily query them um, thanks to uh, uh, thanks to a language, which is called PromQL which is a Prometheus query language, and you can just type it. Um, if you are using Grafana and Grafana 9, you now have a new PromQL editor to help you write those uh, queries. But basically, it's very powerful. This is a very simple example to see, OK, how can I get the rate of HTTP request? But the language itself is quite powerful, and you can use it uh, in many ways to really uh, understand your application and your metrics. So let's see now the relationship between Prometheus and Consul uh, from the Prometheus standpoint. So as I said, so Prometheus can do service discovery and it can uh, integrate with Consul, which means that you can use Prometheus to directly um, discover and scrape your targets, uh, which are all your Consul services. For that, there is a configuration item, which is called called console SD configs, SD means service discovery. And it will just like stream all the console service list to Prometheus, which means that we are using the console API, we are using watches, so we are not always pulling your console server. So even if you are a busy console server, we, we are still very optimized. And then you get an up-to-date service list. You can filter it um, before or after you have got the list. So you have a lot of flexibility with the labels that you want. So you can really adapt the labels you need for your infrastructure, for your alerting, based on uh, everything that you have in your uh, console uh, service discovery information. So when I say that you have labels, so the way that this works in Prometheus is that when you are using service discovery, you will get a number of meta labels that you can use. Uh, for example, this is the console example, but you have the service, the tags, the node name. You have all the metadata that you are putting in your uh, service. You can find them back in Prometheus. You have the data center. If you look at Kubernetes, you will have the pod name, the annotation, the labels. All of that will also be available directly uh, to be consumed by Prometheus. And then with those labels, you can decide to keep them. Like, I want to see the data center in all my uh, metrics. Or you can just decide, OK, uh, I will take the service name, and I will only monitor, for example, the traffic nodes. 
So you can really f do the filtering, you can change the addresses, you can change a lot of things uh, based on those labels, which enables you to uh, monitor exactly the infrastructure the way you actually want it, and to organize your metrics the way you want. And before we uh, go deeper, I want to highlight uh, the acting philosophy that I like, uh, the idea is that you should only page someone if there is a critical failure which is actionable. So if you receive an alert and you are like, okay, it's fine, and then you close your phone, then you should not have been paged by this alert. Um, another, another thing is that you need to know what you are alerted on. For example, in our Nomad clusters, we initially set up uh, an alert when a console check is failing. But when you have those answer of different services, and you see, OK, console check is failing, what does it actually mean? So this is not really actionable. This is not a useful alert. Uh, so you should not be paged on that kind of alert. So um, however, uh, I think it's still fine to keep some, some uh, alerts. I call it ambience alerts, which means that when you are actually paged, then you can see, OK, in my data center, I also have this, 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 this alert. OK, so then I think that the issue is uh, that specific alert, and then you can actually start and fix the uh, issue quite more quickly. But really, like uh, alerting on everything at the first time, uh, it's not a good idea, and that's actually how you can get alert fatigue. So, in the in the talk later, you will see that we will not like recommend a lot of different alerts because that's how you get alert fatigue. And alerting on everything, on every metric, on every latency spike, uh, is not something that uh, is recommended, especially with services like console and vault, which are mostly like backend services. Uh, you want to alert more like on your own services when they are slow, and then you can dig down and look, OK, I see that uh, this is good by console being slow or vault being slow. So let's look at console itself and the console telemetry. Uh, first. In console, you will find two different uh, ways to monitor them. It is primitives. You have the console exporter. So the console exporter, it is an official Prometheus exporter, which has been there for quite a long time. And what it, what it will do it well, it, is that it will expose the console cluster health uh, that is get, get from the console API. You can also expose the key value stores um, the key values that are in the key store, so that if you want, for example, to set the threshold and monitor on that threshold, you can store it in the console key store, and then you can use it for graphing or for alerting. So if you say, uh, my, I, I want to alert on that specific metric, you can just put it in console, and then you can reuse that in your alerting uh, queries. The console exporter is connecting to a single instance of your, of your uh, uh, a single console instance. But console also has telemetry, so this was added in console three or four years ago. Uh, it's built in, uh, and you get uh, metrics that you don't have with a console exporter. For example, you get all the runtime metrics, like the memory, the CPU usage, uh, the autopilot, console autopilot metric, uh, raft metrics, and all the calls that are made to console, like uh, key value store calls, but also like service API calls, all of that you can see that inside the console telemetry. The console telemetry, it is not primitive specific. You can also configure it with StatsD, with Datadog, and other monitoring solutions. And that's actually how you will configure it for Prometheus. So you want to disable the host name in the telemetry because by default, console will expose the host name which in Prometheus will just cause a duplicate label. It will not be useful because when Prometheus will scrape uh, the metrics from console, it will already uh, add the host name itself. And then you have the retention time um, because uh, some of the metrics uh, will have some historical data like uh, summaries, I think, and then you want to have like a small buffer. Um, I have seen in the wild people that have like a retention time for the metrics of 24 hours. Uh, so that will depend on, the, on your use case. But this is what you need to enable Prometheus. So the Prometheus retention time is actually mandatory. So you need to set it in order to enable the Prometheus exporter inside a console. 
And in primitives, this is pretty basic, except the two last lines. So you will just say, OK, this is my console servers. Uh, if you have a static, um, quite static infrastructure, you can just like uh, point to the console servers, but you can also uh, discover your console server using the Kubernetes API or any service query that Prometheus has. And then you need to specify a uh, metrics path because Promet uh, Prometheus expects by default that you reach out slash metrics, but in console you need to use VOA, uh, slash v1 agent metrics. And then there is an HTTP parameter called format that you need to use uh, and that needs to be Prometheus. Um, that's, yeah, I, I think that's about it for this slide. Uh, and then if you need to look into the alert that you want to do with console, um, you can, so the console exporter, you, you want to, be sh to make sure that you can get the metrics from the console exporter. So you have two metrics there. You have the up metric, which means, okay, the console exporter, it is, um, it is running, and console up means that, oh, and also it can query console. So you need to check both of those metrics. Otherwise, you don't know the metrics you actually have, or you have another issue in your infrastructure. Then you have, um, is there a leader? So there is a, a metric in the console exporter that tells you if there is actually a leader in console, so console can take decisions. And then you can check the number of uh, peers that are in the raft uh, in the cluster of console, and you can see that it matches your expectations, that you don't have a console that's gone. Then you have the telemetry uh, console, and then there is a very handy metric. So you can check that console, that you can scrape console uh, with the up metric, which is added automatically by primitives. So when it's zero, then your target is down. When it's up, it's uh, one. And then you can uh, check the autopilot, which is the consulting. And you know that if the autopilot says that it's not healthy, then you need to react and you need to see what's going on in console. Um, I also want to add that, uh, of course, in the Prometheus configuration itself, you can uh, authenticate to console. That's not an issue. So if you are using ACLs, uh, you can totally uh, pass the, the bearer token to Prometheus, and if you just work. Uh, and you will be able to connect to your uh, console cluster even with SELs, of course. Uh, a few words about Vault. So Vault, the same uh, configuration as for uh, console. So this is the SEL uh, configuration. So again, it's quite simple. And uh, the uh, Prometheus configuration is also very similar. The difference that you have there is that the metric path for Vault itself is that uh, instead of V1 agent metrics, you need to use V1 sys metrics. And again, I have not added that there, but you can also give Prometheus a token. It can read the token from uh, a file, or it can, um, or you can put the token in the Prometheus file. So what we uh, what we have, what we have already, uh, done in Prometheus is we have added the ability to read the tokens from files, which means that if you, are, you, if you need Vault to connect to your application, for example, then you can use the Vault uh, agent to write uh, to a sync file, and then Prometheus will pick that file on every request, and it will actually be able to use your tokens that Prometheus will read from the file to connect to your targets. So in Vault, um, really like you want to check that the Vault is up. And then uh, it's also very important to check that the Vault is unsealed. So uh, because it, if it's unsealed, you can wake up a few people to actually uh, start looking into it and enter their keys. And then Vault is another uh, thing. It, there is the audit log of Vault. And basically, the Vault audit log uh, it must work. So if, you, if your audit log starts showing failures, then you know that Vault is not working. So that's a security feature of Vault, that like you need to check the log request and the log response uh, audit logs, and they must succeed. So that's another alert, because then you are 100% sure that Vault is not working. 
Um, another thing is that in the alert manager, so that's also nice to uh, reduce alert inhibition because you will say, yes, but uh, if Vault is unsealed, I will be alerted by my application because it's no longer working. Yes, but there is also alert inhibition. Uh, alert inhibition, it's a concept in, the pr in primitives, which means that if you have a certain alert which is firing, then you can decide to silence other alerts. For example, if Vault is sealed, you know your application will fail. And then you can start inhibiting the other alerts, so the only page that you get will be that Vault is unsealed. Prometheus will still collect the metrics for your application, so you will still be able to see what's going on with your application, but the only page that you should get is that Vault is sealed, because that's the actionable uh, alert that you <coughs> get. All the other alerts, Vault, uh, your application is giving 500 errors because Vault is down. Yeah, you probably already know that. Uh, and it's not actionable. That what's actionable is Vault being down. So this is an example of inhibition. Uh, you can see that we have a source match, uh, which is the alert name. So we have an alert name, uh, which is called Vault is sealed. And then if you have an alert, Vault is sealed, and you don't want to receive the alerts, uh, that the error rate is too high. And you can also add equal at the end, which means that you will only see that for the, in the same data center. So if you have another application in another cluster that has an error rate too high, uh, that should not use that Vault, then you will still get those alerts. <coughs> so the data center label should also be the same. So at the end, um, unless you are really running a console, uh, as a service, uh, you should not really uh, try to have 10,000 alerts on your console uh, cluster. And I would even say that uh, the customer that I have seen with nice uh, console dashboards, Vault dashboards, they just never use them uh, because they directly see at their application level in their traces uh, that the issue is coming from Vault or from console. So, when you want to monitor uh, console and vault, I would not jump directly into making the maximum dashboard, the maximum alerts that you can set up, because you will just lose a lot of time for things that you will just barely use. Um, however, the very few console and vault alerts that you have presented there then can really help you uh, pinpoint root causes when you have failures in your application that might be caused by console or vault. Um, and yeah, once again, um, thank you for being at this talk.